Today we come to the moral influence theory of the atonement. This theory of the atonement is most often associated with the um, 12th century uh, logician and theologian Peter Abelard. Now you may have heard of Abelard in a different connection with this because of the famous love affair between Eloise and Abelard. As a young priest, Abelard was hired by a family to tutor their young teenage daughter, Eloise, and he seduced her, more or less forced himself upon her sexually, um, but she fell in love with him, and they began this um, love affair that finally culminated in marriage. But uh, her father, to say the least, was not pleased about Abelard's seducing their daughter, and so he hired a gang of thugs to break into Abelard's uh, residence one night, and they castrated him uh, in bed. Uh, whereupon, Eloise was then consigned to a nunnery for the rest of her life, uh, and Abelard went on to become a very famous theologian um, and philosopher. <laughs> so, the moral influence theory of the atonement. Now, according to atonement theories of this type, Christ achieved our reconciliation with God not by ransoming us from the devil or by satisfying God's justice, but rather by moving our hearts to contrition and love as we contemplate Christ's voluntarily suffering on our behalf so horrible and tortuous a death. So on this theory, nothing actually happened between God and man that afternoon on Golgotha when Jesus was crucified. No sins were punished. Uh, no debt was paid. The entire power of the cross to make atonement lies in its serving as an example which then produces a subjective response in us as we contemplate Christ's voluntarily laying down his life for us. In his commentary on the book of Romans, uh, when he reaches the section on the atonement in chapter 3, verses 24 to 26, Abelard tries to explain how Christ's death achieves atonement. He agrees with Anselm in rejecting ransom theories of the atonement. He says that Satan has no rights over human beings that God has to respect. And that raises the question then, and I quote, what need was there, I say, for the Son of God, for the sake of our redemption, when he received flesh, to endure so many great fasts, reproaches, lashings, spitting, and finally the most violent and shameful death of the cross." End quote. Now this is exactly the same question that drove Anselm's inquiry in Why Did God Become Man? And Abelard realizes that any ransom that is paid to redeem mankind has to be paid to God, not to the devil. The devil is at the very most merely our jailer and uh, torturer by God's permission. But the devil doesn't have any rights over us which God must respect. On the other hand, neither does Abelard seem to be persuaded by Anselm's answer to the question that Christ's death was a compensatory offering to God to satisfy divine justice. He exclaims, and I quote, how very cruel and unjust it seems that someone should require the blood of an innocent person as a ransom or that in any way it might please him that an innocent person be slain. Still less that God should have accepted the death of his son that through it 
he was reconciled to the whole world." End quote. So on Abelard's view, neither a ransom theory nor a satisfaction theory suffices to explain why Christ would come and submit to such a gruesome and horrible death. His answer then to the question is very different. This is what he says in his commentary on Romans 3, 24 to 6. And I quote, Nevertheless, it seems to us that in this we are justified by the blood of Christ and reconciled to God, that it was through this matchless grace shown to us that his Son received our nature, and in that nature teaching us, both by word and by example, persevered to the death, and bound himself to us uh, even more through love, so that when we have been kindled by so great a benefit of divine grace, true charity might fear to endure nothing for his sake." End quote. So here, Abelard seems to suggest that the way the atonement work works is that Christ's dying, this horrible death, ignites in us a flame of love um, by means of his teaching and his example so that we are uh, fortified to endure even unto death in obedience to him. The uh, example of Christ's uh, uh, death uh, inflames us with love to follow him, become his disciples, and be obedient even unto death. Now I think it's noteworthy that uh, on this theory the objectionable fact about the traditional view such as Anselm had is that on Anselm's view, Abelard says, God needed to be reconciled to the world by Christ's death. But on Abelard's view, we need to be reconciled to God by Christ's death. It is not God who needs to be reconciled to us, it's us, or we, who need to be reconciled to him. And it's become almost an axiom among contemporary uh, proponents of moral influence theories that God does not need to be reconciled to sinners. The entire obstacle to reconciliation lies on our side. Um, God stands with open arms ready to receive us, but our hearts need to be changed so that our hostility to God evaporates and we embrace his love. So Abelard sees atonement as achieved, or achieved rather, as Christ's passion enkindles in our hearts um, a love for God within us, and we're liberated then from sin as we come to love God more and more, and so become more and more righteous. So the atonement works by means of Christ's exemplary um, death on the cross, which then produces in us this effect of loving God more and more so that we become progressively freed from sin. That's the theory. Now taken in isolation, the moral influence theory might seem far too thin to do justice to the biblical data concerning subjects like God's wrath for example, which lies on unbelievers, or uh, Christ's substitutionary death, his suffering is vicarious in nature, or what the Bible has to say about justification uh, before God, and so on and so forth. The moral influence theory taken in isolation seems to amount to little more than a sort of self-improvement uh, inspired by the example of Christ. And that seems far too weak a theory to be plausible as representing a New Testament doctrine of the atonement. But significantly, scholars have in recent years uh, called into question the assumption that this passage that I've just quoted from 
Abelard's commentary on Romans 3 really represents Abelard's full atonement theory rather than just a facet of it. For example, in his comment on Romans chapter 4 and verse 25, just one chapter later, Abelard writes the following, Christ is said to have died on account of our transgressions in two ways. On the one hand, because we transgressed on account of which he died and we committed sin, the penalty of which he bore. And on the other hand, that he might take away our sins by dying, that is, he swept away the penalty for sins by the price of his death, leading us to paradise and through the demonstration of so much grace, he drew back our souls from the will to sin and kindled the highest love of himself." Now in this remarkable passage, Abelard actually appears to endorse the penal substitution theory, which would later be expounded at greater length by the Protestant reformers. Here Abelard affirms that Christ bore the penalty for our sins, thereby removing the penalty from us. This is penal substitution. And the moral influence of Christ's death uh, is mentioned then in the final clause of the sentence where he says, through the demonstration of so much grace, he drew back our souls from the will to sin and kindled the highest love of himself. The moral influence of Christ's death is now seen to be just a part of a much more comprehensive theory, um, just as it was for Anselm. Anselm also speaks of the influence of Christ's voluntary suffering. So that both of them have the moral influence of Christ's death as merely one facet of a broader theory that in uh, Abelard's case at least, seem to include penal substitution as well. And I think as one element in a more complex, uh, multifaceted theory, the moral influence theory does make a valuable contribution to understanding how the benefits that have been won by Christ's death come to be appropriated. We are moved by Christ's voluntary uh, suffering and death to respond to the offer of his love and forgiveness and so come to embrace the forgiveness uh, and the salvation that are won uh, by means of his satisfying divine justice. So as just a component of a broader theory it seems to me that there is real value in the moral influence theory even though as a standalone theory it would be um, woefully inadequate. Any discussion than of the moral influence view. Uh, Bill, um, Friedrich Schleiermacher, you know, is considered, I think, to uh, be maybe one of the authors of the view that um, Christ's death was not necessary to pay for our sins or discharge our punishment, but instead to convince us humans that God is not really mad at us. Do you fit that into this moral influence theory? Is that part of the same idea? You mean a, a kind of a continuation of this moral influence yes. theory? Um, it's very interesting, George, you should ask that because when I did my doctoral exams in theology under Wolfhard Pollenbach and um, we had our oral exams, one of the questions he asked me was what was the role of the death of Christ in Schleiermacher's theology? And I I couldn't think of anything, and I, I said, I don't know. And he said, uh, it plays no role whatsoever. Uh, for, for Schleiermacher, the death of Christ doesn't have any inherent significance in it, except, as you say, as this kind of moral influence. And so I would see Schleiermacher's view as a kind of uh, extension of this broad um, view that nothing really happens at the cross. Um, the whole impact of the cross 
is that it somehow has a subjective impact upon us. And for Schleiermacher, what it did was not augment our love of God, as it did for Abelard, but our consciousness of God. For Schleiermacher, Christian salvation involved coming into a deeper consciousness of God and our dependence upon him uh, moment by moment. And um, the death of Christ could play a role in, um, in, in that sense, that we would come into a greater God consciousness. But really, this is so typical of modern theology that in getting away from satisfaction theories, whether of Anselm's type or penal substitution, there's little left in the atonement except for this sort of moral influence. Um, and so th this, this kind of theory, broadly speaking, is, I think, extremely widespread today. Yeah, David Wells, who I think was your colleague at Trinity, he taught yes. a class on history of the atonement. And he seemed to trace this moral influence theory back to Schleiermacher, but you take it back to Abelard. It's normally associated with Abelard because of the passage that I read where he talks about how after rejecting Anselm's view and the ransom view, he propounds this view that it, it kindles our hearts in love to follow him and so become more righteous and overcome our sins. But um, I could see why in modern theology, Schleiermacher would be an influence upon the modern movement. I mean, after all, that would have been in the 19th century, and this is, we're talking about here about 12th century, much, much earlier during the medieval period. Yes, it seems Cash. to me that um, this is so dangerously close to what a lot of the other cults and world religions think about Jesus, that he was just a, yeah. a good moral example and that you know, he was a good man or a good prophet. And it's this miscategorization of who the person of Jesus was that has led us to this modern idea that there's a good heaven with a good God and good people go there. And as long as you just try and... You know, you send out good feelings on Facebook to people that are in trouble that, you know, surely at the end the good will outweigh the bad, and Jesus was a good example. And so it's the theistic moral, uh, what, do, what do you call it, Garrett? Oh, the therapeutic moral Therapeutic moral is the deism. Yeah, it seems like to me like this yeah. was kind of the, the precursor to all of that uh, modern idea that most Americans seem to believe now. Yeah, I, I appreciate what you're saying, Cash, and you, you pointed out a, 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 an effective point. Abelard may have believed in the deity of Christ, but Schleiermacher didn't. You, you don't need Christ to be God on this theory, do you, in order for his death to exert a subjective influence on people and kindle love in their hearts? There's no need for the deity of Christ here. So this would be very congenial to modern theologians um, who want to abandon traditional doctrines of Christ's uh, deity and sinlessness and, and so forth. Um, and it, it does have this vision of God, of a God without wrath. Um, I remember there was a characterization of liberal theology during the 19th century that said on liberal theology, a God without wrath leads men without sin into a heaven without a hell by means of a Christ without a cross. And that's sort of the way in which this leads because uh, you, it, it is purely subjective in its impact. Go yeah, ahead. That's exactly what I was just going to say is that it, it dispenses with the uncomfortable problem of telling people that they're sinners and that of, of us uh, acknowledging that we're sinners, that if, if all of a sudden he's just a you know, uh, some sort of a moral example that will lead us to God, then it dispenses with the guilt and problem of sin and death that we have. Well, now, let, let's not be unfair. It is <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> a theory about how sin can be overcome. Uh, it recognizes that we are sinful before God, but here's how sin can be overcome by God's awakening in our hearts, a devotion to him so that we live more righteous lives and... Uh, come to be conformed to um, his character and so forth. But I think where you're right is what it dispenses with 
is a God of wrath. There is on this view no God that needs to be propitiated. Nothing, no divine justice that needs to be satisfied, no divine wrath that needs to be quelled. Um, the entire obstacle, as I say, li lies on man's side of the equation. We need to be reconciled to God, but God doesn't need to be reconciled to us. And that, as I say, has become almost axiomatic among contemporary theologians, that, that God doesn't need to be reconciled to us. We just need to be reconciled to him. And that is predicated upon this idea that divine wrath and justice don't need to be propitiated. Yes? Yeah, I really appreciate how you bring up like prominent theologians uh, through history. A lot of times I haven't heard of them. I'm sure most of us haven't all read about them. Um, I was wondering, I think I've, I find myself wondering this often about the theologians that you discuss, particularly about Abelard, but what his contribution was. Like, was he a guy who happened to represent a theory that was that was going out over the time, and he happens to be the figurehead that we talked talk hmm. about in this? Was he the originator? Like, what was his sort of... I do think it would be fair to say that he was the originator of this moral influence theory. And he was a figure of considerable controversy during his day. I didn't mention this, but one of the persons that bitterly opposed him was Bernard of Clairvaux, the great uh, monk. Cler Bernard of Clairvaux denounced um, Abelard to the Pope and said that his views were heretical and uh, it became the uh, subject of great controversy during his lifetime. So this was important. Yes, this was not obscure. It, it caused real controversy in the church because of his views. Another thing that just came to mind as you were speaking about Schleiermacher, he was raised in an Orthodox Christian home, and there's a very moving letter that he wrote to his father when he was a student, explaining to his father how he could just no longer believe in these traditional doctrines like the atonement uh, and the vicarious suffering of Christ. I think in the Wikipedia article on Schleiermacher, this letter may be quoted there. I think you might be able to find it there. But it's very tragic, it's very sad, as you see this young man raised in a, an Orthodox home letting go of orthodoxy um, because of the problems that he perceived, partly in the doctrine of the atonement. And we still consider him a theologian if he's rejected the doctrine yes, of the Yes, yeah, he's called the father of modern theology, Schleiermacher is, because he then went on to write a book called The Christian Faith, in which he lays out his new vision of what the Christian faith really is, and then... German theology, uh, by the end of the um, 19th century, had just degenerated into theological liberalism that was described by me a moment ago as a god without wrath, leading men without sin into a heaven without hell by means of a Christ without a cross. That was classical liberal theology. Um, and was, in a sense, the legacy of, of Schleiermacher. And if you think this is just among academic theologians, you see this is what then came to dominate in Protestant mainline denominations um, that up until the 1950s were culturally dominant in the United States, uh, but now are more and more losing members. They're in free fall as the mainline denominations are collapsing, and evangelical Christianity, which has stayed true to biblical faith, is resurgent. Any other discussion? Okay, maybe you've gone over this before, but I was just a little confused between the difference of us being reconciled to God and God being reconciled to us. Could you explain that yes. a little bit more for me? It's very interesting when you read the New Testament that nowhere is the word reconciliation uh, in the Greek, katalasso, uh, 
used with respect to God. Instead, it's always used with respect to man that by Christ's death we were reconciled to him. And although this is an argument from silence, the fact that it never says God is reconciled to us has led many, many modern theologians to say that God doesn't need to be reconciled to us. He has his arms out. He is a welcoming God. All we have to do is come to him. And so the purpose of the atonement is to overcome our hostility to God. Whereas on traditional atonement theories, even if you don't call it reconciliation, God's wrath is upon the unbeliever. The first three chapters of the book of Romans are all about how God's wrath is upon Jew and Gentile alike because of their sin, and it is through Christ that this wrath is propitiated and taken away. So even if the New Testament doesn't use the word reconcile with respect to God, the concept is there in that the death of Christ propitiates God. It satisfies his justice. It removes his wrath. And, um, and so I think the concept of reconciliation is there, if not the word. Is that clear? Yeah, that's right. Thank okay. you. Yes, Bruce? Well, okay. Yeah, let's pick up Bruce on the way by. Well, you know, these things seem all fragmented, you know, to, uh, and, and, and emphasizing a particular quality of, of, of Christ's work, but I, I think they're, they're more inclusive. For example, yes. in the talking about what we were just mentioning, is that if you seek reconciliation, you're seeking to remove the wrath of God, and you're taking this path mm -hmm. that you want to be reconciled. It's such a part of repentance and changing your mind. So these are, I see these as uh, multiple facets of Christ's atoning work rather than exclusive, exclusive yes, I think one to the other. Yes, I think you're just absolutely correct about this, Bruce. And I've become convinced of this more and more. At one time, I had nothing but disdain for the moral influence theory. But as I've said, and as you indicate, as a facet of a broader, richer theory, this is a vital part of, I think, a full-blooded atonement theory about how Christ's death moves our hearts to repentance and faith so that we appropriate the benefits of what he did. If this just, say, happened in secret, uh, Christ was slain by God in a cave somewhere and no one ever reported it, saw it, or knew about it, all of that moral influence of his death would be lost. And what a powerful influence that has been historically upon mankind. Not only people coming to Christ, but Christians enduring terrible suffering, even unto death, inspired by his example. So this theory as a facet of a broader theory does have a role to play. Yes, Steve? Yeah, um, just a few thoughts. The, the Old Testament also says that God didn't have to be reconciled. So we need to be reconciled to him because in, a, in Ezekiel it says that if the guy who's doing wrong will stop doing wrong, he'll live. You know. Now, we have a conscience, and so we keep bringing that back up and condemning ourselves. The, in the fall, the New Testament says man darkened his mind. In the Old Testament, the word shalom is, is may be made whole. And God gives us a picture of what happened uh, when you walk covenant, God walked covenant with Abraham. And the concept of walking covenant is you split the animals in two and you walk between them and they pledge. And if any party was to break that pledge, they would be split in two like those animals were split mm -hmm. in two. So we break the pledge, our concept of God splits in two. So now we no longer know God. In fact, that's why we darken our minds to escape the self-condemnation. When God said, if we sin, we'll die, he didn't say, I'll kill you. But he said, you'll die. And we did die spiritually. Now, what Christ did is uh, he showed us the level of, 
it requires a new life, which we all know. Anybody that hangs on a tree, even the tree of life, is cursed, right? And so you need a new hope in you. Remember, First Peter says we're born again of a lively hope. And so he died to give us a new hope that is not anything we can do is in what he did for us. And so if you be content with that, you have that new hope. And the sting of death, of not doing your own will, because what is death but is your life or your wills and your desires. And so you're now able to live God's true will with peace, even in the midst of trouble. In yeah. fact, it's only in trouble. Okay, can you, you wrap it up here, Steve? So that Okay. And so uh, mm-hmm. let's see. Well, remember, the Bible says we don't know ourselves as we're truly known by him. But then as you overcome, yeah. you do. So, All right. What I would want to respond to this is to say, look again at our survey of the biblical data involving the Old Testament sacrifices. I think it's very evident in those Levitical sacrifices that God provided a means of propitiation, right? Those sacrifices were given by God so that his wrath and justice would be propitiated by the animal sacrifices. And so I think that the uh, death of Christ is foreshadowed in those sacrifices and shows that it's not just we who need reconciliation to God, but that God also needs to be propitiated uh, in order for us to come to him. Well, let me move on then to the penal substitutionary theory uh, of the Protestant reformers. The Protestant reformers, while appreciative of Anselm's satisfaction theory and recognizing Christ's death as satisfying divine justice, interpreted the satisfaction of God's justice not in terms of compensation, as Anselm did, but in terms of punishment. That is to say, Christ voluntarily bore the suffering which was due to us as the punishment for our sins. And therefore, there's no longer any punishment due to those who are the beneficiaries of Christ's death. God's wrath is propitiated on this view by Christ's substitutionary death because the demands of God's justice have been met. More than that, according to the Protestant reformers, our sins have been imputed to Christ. And so our sin is expiated by Christ's substitutionary death. So God's wrath is propitiated by the death of Christ, and our sin is expiated by the death of Christ because uh, his substitutionary punishment removed from us the punishment due to us for our sins. Now, on the view of the Reformers, the imputation of our sins to Christ is purely a legal transaction. Christ in himself remained morally pure, a paradigm of love and selflessness and courage uh, and so forth, but legally our sin was imputed to Christ's account. Now, although this imputation of our sin to Christ was purely a forensic or legal matter, a Protestant reformer such as Martin Luther could speak of it in very colorful terms. In his commentary on the book of Galatians, this is what Luther writes, and I quote, Being the unspotted lamb of God, Christ was personally innocent. But because he took the sins of the world, his sinlessness was defiled with the sinfulness of the world. Whatever sins I, you, all of us have committed or shall commit, they are Christ's sins as if he had committed them himself. Our sins have to be Christ's sins or we shall perish forever. Our merciful Father in heaven, therefore, sent his only Son into the world and said to him, You are now Peter, the liar, Paul, the persecutor, David, the adulterer, Adam, the disobedient, the thief on the cross. You, my son, must pay the world's iniquity. The law growls 
all right if your son is taking the sin of the world. I see no sins anywhere else but in him. He shall die on the cross. And the law kills Christ, but we go free. End quote. Moreover, Luther thought, just as our sins are imputed to Christ, his righteousness, in turn, is imputed to us through faith in him. Luther writes, and I quote, Believe in Christ, and your sins will be pardoned. His righteousness will become your righteousness, and your sins will become his sins. So, in Luther's view, at the cross, there is this marvelous transaction that takes place. Our sins are legally imputed to Christ. His righteousness, in turn, is legally imputed to us. He suffers the punishment due to us for our sins, thereby freeing us from punishment and leaving us with the imputed righteousness of Christ, whereby we are justified and counted as righteous in God's sight. Now, having uh, sketched the Reformers' view of the penal substitution theory, I want to say something more about it next week by looking at one of the greatest of the post-Reformation theologians, the Swiss, uh, or French-Swiss, uh, theologian François Turretin. who developed the penal substitution theory in considerable sophistication. So the next time we meet, we'll look at Turretin's development of the penal substitution theory. Let's close with a word of prayer. Father, we thank you that Christ's death for us has indeed kindled our hearts to love him and to be his disciples and to follow him. And that by doing so, in faith, we become the beneficiaries of his death on our behalf. Thank you for the chance to ponder more deeply these great themes, and we pray that our lives would be changed as a result of what we thought about even today. Through Christ our Lord, amen.